never fails. And today we're going to finish that off. Next week we start a new series leading up to Easter. I'm so excited about Easter coming up soon. Always a wonderful time. We're going to go to 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 13. 1 Samuel 3.13 is what we're going to be looking at. They were talking about discipline. How many like discipline? Nope. <laughs> Depends on if you're getting it or giving it. <laughs> yeah, it depends on if you're getting it or giving it. <clears throat> 1 Samuel 3, we're just going to read that one verse, but the whole the whole story in chapter 3 is really an amazing story. But we're going to read verse 13. Uh, I have warned him that judgment is coming upon his family forever because his sons are blaspheming God and he hasn't disciplined them. The story is about Eli, the high priest <clears throat> at the time, and he had a couple of sons, Hophni and Phinehas. And so these guys were horrible guys. They were terrible. And they were not doing the right thing. And they were taking the offerings for themselves instead of, you know, uh, and they were just doing a, a lot of different things, sleeping with the women and just, it was horrible. And the dad never corrected them. The father never corrected them. And so God had already told him one time, you need to correct your children or I'm going to judge your household. And it didn't happen. And so now this little boy named Samuel is in the temple and the God speaks to him, right? And God gives him a word. He says, this is what I want you to tell Eli. And of course, we get to this verse and he says, I've already told him this. I'm telling him again that, um, that his family is going to be cut short and because they're, they're kids, his kids are blaspheming me and he has not done anything to correct them. And it's interesting because when Samuel actually tells Eli what God told him, <clears throat> Eli says, oh, well, it's the Lord. He'll do whatever's right. Instead of actually repenting and falling on his face before God and then really disciplining his children. These are grown children, by the way. They're adults. He just kind of goes with the flow. And so in the end, the end of that story is that both of his sons were killed in battle. When he learned of it, he fell over and probably died of a heart attack. But all three of them died the same day. And that was God's judgment. A very harsh judgment on the priest. Uh, he was the high priest, so it was, you know, God, he was holding him to a much higher standard. This morning, we look at the big idea of the message is this parenting fail when we are more concerned with making our children happy than helping them follow God. A lot of times you hear this well, if that's what makes you happy, well, what if they like robbing banks? Well, if that's what <laughs> that's makes what you no. happy. <laughs> no, right? I mean, we're smart enough to say, no, it's not about necessarily doing what makes you happy. It's about doing the right thing. It's about following hard after God. And it's about picking up your cross, denying yourself, and following hard after God. Because our goal is for our children to know God, to love God, to serve God. Right? That's our goal. If our goal isn't necessarily for them to be happy. We want them to be happy. Nobody, I don't think there's a parent around that wants their kids to be miserable. Any parents want your kids to be miserable? Maybe once in a while when they make your life miserable, you want to get them back. But all of us, I think, as parents, want the best for our children. That's just nature. We want good things for our kids. You know, we hear this all the time. I want them to have better than what I had. Yes. Anybody ever oh, actually yes. said that to your yes. kids? Yes. I want you to have better than what I had. I want you to have more things than what I had. Oh, I want you to have more opportunity yes. than what I had. Right? I, my dad told me that. I mean, he grew up poor in the farmlands of Mexico and, you know, came to America, brought his whole family, became a jeweler, had his own business. You know, we were, I never, I'm the youngest of nine children, but I didn't wear hand-me-downs. My father provided for us. He was a hard-working man. He provided for us. But, you know, I didn't see much of my father other than in the store working. And so we had that conversation one time about him working so much. And he, he told me that. He said, well, because I wanted you to have what I didn't have. You know, I wanted you to have the stuff that I never got to have. And I said to him, you know, I said, Dad, 
I could have done with less stuff and more of you. Right. Because I really want to just hang out with you. Yeah. You know, I just want to get to know you and hear some stories about your past and just different things. So, it, you know, we want good things for our kids. We want better things for our kids than what we had. And, you know, I want to tell you that the best thing you can give your children is an experience instead of stuff. Instead of buying them toys or buying them gadgets or whatever, the most important thing you can give them is time. Yeah. Time with you. They want, believe it or not, they, they actually like you most of the time. Mom, Dad, your kids actually like you. Go figure, right? But do, right? They actually, they actually kind of like you and, and don't mind hanging out with you. Now, not all the time. Let's not get crazy. You know, gosh, we need our, we need our space, right? Mom, Dad, we need our space, right? Oh my gosh, when they're little, it's just. I saw a thing the other day. I was thinking about Josh and Tori. It said at Hobby Lives, a little sign that said, uh, "Today's goal: keep the tiny humans alive." I feel for you guys. Right? I know what it's like to have little ones, a couple of little ones running around. But you know, the the kids, they they mostly want to spend time with you. They want to get to know you. They want to hear the stories. You know, anybody done, um, what do they call it, an ancestry tree or genealogy? A genealogy? Have, some of you have done that? Yeah, I was able to trace one grandmother down to uh, early 1600s in Spain. Wow. One of them. Wow. Okay. And, 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 yeah, but it's crazy. But I started, as I, as I was doing that, I thought, now that I'm older, I have so many questions I could have asked my mom and dad. You know, because I didn't know a lot about their own family, about their own brothers and sisters or their uncles and, and nephews and so forth. I mean, you don't think about that until afterwards and you're like, I could have asked. I never thought of asking that. So, you know, spending time with your kids is so important. Giving our kids stuff in place of time does not equal love. You can't make up for lost time by buying them stuff. Okay. Uh, there's, I like this quote. A child is going to remember... Love is spelled time, T-I-M-E, thank you. A child is going to remember who was there, not what you spent on them. Kids outgrow a toy and outfits, but they never outgrow time and love. Amen. Those of you that have lost your mom and dad, they've already gone home to glory, what would you do for just a few minutes to sit and talk with them? Wouldn't that be, I mean, that is so priceless now. You know, you, you don't want to have them come back to buy you anything. You just want to sit. Can we just have lunch? My treat, you know. We just want to sit and talk and visit. Tell them how much you love them. Tell them how much you miss them. Then wouldn't that be awesome if we could yeah. do that? Yeah. I mean, that's all we want is just to spend time with them. Amen. The second thing we look at is that discipline leads to a life well lived. We're talking about discipline this morning. There's so many scriptures. Gosh, I punched in the word discipline in my Bible search thing, and there's so many scriptures. Oh my gosh, we'd be here all day, but I did pick several that I thought were really cool. Hebrews 12, 11, <coughs> no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Somebody say amen to that. Mm -hmm. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. So we, we have to learn how to discipline our children, you know, even from a young age, and, and we've got to be smart about that. Proverbs 3.12, the Lord disciplines those he loves as a father, the son he delights in. Proverbs 10.17, whoever heeds discipline shows the way to life, but whoever ignores corrections leads others astray. Proverbs 13.18, whoever disregards discipline comes to poverty and shame, but whoever heeds correction is honored. Proverbs 13, 24, whoever spares the rod hates his children, but the one who loves their children is careful to discipline them. And Proverbs, one of my favorite verses, Proverbs 22, 15, which I memorized a long time ago in the KJV. <laughs> Foolishness is bound up in the heart of the child, but the rod of correction will drive it far from him. <laughs> How many like that verse? I like that verse, right? The rod of correction. I know y'all think about the rod. My mom would make me go get a, a stick from the oleander bush outside. And I was happy to do it because I thought my brother David and Tony, they're going to get it. Well, guess who the first one she hit with that switch, right? I'd take a really nice liberal one, you know, and 
pull all the leaves off man i was, I was a good kid i said surely surely she's not gonna hit me because i was the obedient one that went and got the switch uh, i don't think so man i was the first one she hit with that thing oh my gosh yeah it took me a while before i figured out i'm not going out there anymore you go get your own switch mom it's not gonna happen okay i know that's what we think of when we think of the rod of correction but it doesn't necessarily mean uh, physical, it doesn't necessarily mean physical uh, uh, discipline, you know, like with a belt or switch or paddle. How many were paddled in school? Anybody remember being paddled in school when they still actually allowed that? Yeah. Oh, God, I was paddled all the way from kindergarten. To, I, had, I still remember a teacher named Mrs. Strong in elementary. Yeah, her name was Mrs. Strong. Well, she had a right arm that could, Ooh, she get that paddle out, take me out the hallway. I don't know what I had done. I was such an innocent, <laughs> wonderful child. But I seemed to be out in that hallway a lot. All the way up to middle school. When I was caught doing something I shouldn't have done. And the vice principal happened to be the one cat catch me. And he pulled out that, that, that paddle. Ooh, man. I don't know what it was I did, but I'm sure I never done it again. Or I made sure I never got caught doing it again, whichever one that was. So there are different schools of thought when it comes to physical discipline. And, you know, you just you have to remember, never discipline in anger or frustration. Ever, ever. Don't ever, you know, use it as a, man, as a means to uh, physically beat a child or punish a child in that way. That's not ever what it's meant to be mom dad you should if your kid has really frustrated you so much and disobeyed you and i mean just gotten on your last nerve you, you really ought to stop and, and count and, and do something before you you get the, the belt out of the, whatever it is you're going to use okay <clears throat> never discipline in anger frustration i like this quote by tom landry the used to be the coach for the dallas cowboys back in the day yeah Yes, okay, we, we got a cheer for Tom Landry. <laughs> the role of the coach is to make people do things they don't want to do to achieve the results they want to achieve. That basically is discipline. We want to train our children to, to walk in the right ways. And so our kids are going to do some dumb stuff, right? Our kids do dumb stuff, make dumb decisions, and we're there to correct them, to talk to them, to discipline them, and you have to always remember to be age appropriate. All right, you have to be age appropriate. You can't treat, you can't discipline a three-year-old the way you do a 12-year-old. It doesn't work that way. So you have to adjust. Now, you know, we used to say back back in our day, before the internet, we used to say, well, you know, we, we became parents. There was no manual. Nobody gave us a manual. You just did what you figured your parents did, right? Mm -hmm. and, and that you just kind of try to improve on what they did. But nowadays, there's no excuse. There's so much information out there. You get on the internet and go to Dr. Dobson or any of these other guys. Uh, Tony Evans has a wonderful book out. I mean, there's so much information. It's almost information overload, right? You see that all the time. But all you know, you've got all these different age level things. That, but it's important that we understand and we continue to learn as parents because it's it's not an exact science. And I'm going to tell you, every one of my children, we've had five children, each one of those children has their own personality. You cannot discipline them the same, right? Because this one, you know, is different than that one. And, and they're just, every single one of them has to be treated differently. It may seem unfair, right? When, when you're one of the siblings and how come he got a beaten and this one didn't get a beaten? It just, it depends, right, on their attitude, it depends on what's going on, it depends on their character. So each child has to be treated differently, and God will give you wisdom. So uh, we want to discipline age accordingly. I like this quote, discipline is inevitable, but if it does not come from within a man, it will be imposed from without. <laughs> discipline is inevitable. If it does not come from within a man, it's going to come from without. Listen. I would rather discipline my children in love and have them walk in the right path than for them to have the law trying to discipline them in the court system. You know, we don't want them. We don't want the law to be the one disciplining them, right? Right. Uh, I think it was uh, Danny, and I think it was I think it was uh, Wolfred. Danny and Wolfred were in the backyard playing with BB guns. Uh -oh. And had inadvertently, one of those babies, or two or three of them, had gone through the crack in the fence over to the neighbor's sliding glass door, which was now shattered. 
and no, he, they, uh, the neighbor decides to call. No. Yeah. Oh, Danny, oh, not Danny, Danny. not little Danny. 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 <laughs> That's what I said, right? The cop comes knocking at our door, <laughs> right? And she's got her hand on the gun. She walks into that backyard, and they're over there, and they, they look like they look like guns, right? The cop even said those things look like a real gun. If you would have pointed at me, it would have ended real bad. Wow. That's what she. That's what she said. So, you know, that they were getting disciplined. I mean, she went on and gave them a talking to. Now, the crazy thing about it, all Danny and Wilford remember was, that was one hot police officer. <laughs> <laughs> she was blonde, she was gorgeous. They don't remember the shooting, the window out, the cost of $300,000. Lord have mercy. <laughs> he still wants to be a cop when he grows up. Yeah. <laughs> and it's hard to discipline them when they still have the BB gun in their hands. So you have to yeah. disarm them first and then discipline them. You can't make that stuff up, man. You cannot even make this stuff. Now you can do it again. I'm surprised they didn't try it again to see if she would show up again. We got to get your number. <laughs> I came across this wonderful article. The link is provided in your, uh, if you get have a smartphone and you go to uh, U version of the Bible events and find things and they got the article. There's a link to this wonderful article by Chip Ingram. It's called Four Parenting Styles and Effective Child Discipline. And I wanted to share these with you because I thought they were very informative. Uh, number one is a permissive parent. You may find yourself in one of these descriptions. The permissive parent is high in love, but very low in discipline and very low in setting boundaries. Will produce children with low self-esteem and feelings of inferiority. Because this parent is a permissive parent. Yeah, go ahead, do whatever you want. And doesn't put boundaries, that child does not learn to have boundaries. And because they don't have boundaries, I thought it was interesting that they end up suffering with low self-esteem because they don't have boundaries. Kids need boundaries. Kids need discipline. They need to know you can only go this far. And they need to know there are consequences for breaking that rule and so forth. The second one is a neglectful parent. The neglectful parent doesn't express much love and really doesn't care enough to discipline at all. <clears throat> Their children tend to grow up with little or no lasting relationship with mom or dad. These children grow up with unbelievably deep emotional scars and their only hope is to find Christ, be surrounded by godly role models, and get some good Christian counseling. This, this one is the, the worst one, by the way, the neglectful parent. Uh, that's the one that kind of lets kids grow up on their own, uh, just lets them do whatever they want. I've seen that happen in families, and the kids do exactly what they tell them. They just do whatever they want. You know, and, and fit, try to figure it out on their own, and then they end up suffering with a lot of different, different issues. The third one is the authoritarian parent. I, I, I would use the word legalistic probably more than anything. This kind of parent doesn't express love and affection well, but is very high on discipline. <clears throat> he doesn't express love and affection well, but is very high on discipline. Authoritarian parents squeeze their kids until the kids can't wait to leave home and as soon as they do they rebel wow my dad was i i look at my dad and i see the authoritarian parent because he he did not express he was not an affectionate type person i knew that he loved me and i knew that he was proud of me but he never ever said those words to me he never said i love you son i'm proud of you man you're killing it man you're awesome never said those words to me right but he was a disciplinarian and you know mom would of course say wait till your father gets home <laughs> the poor dad he's been working all day he don't know what's what we're tearing up what we're doing he'd just come home and she would give him the down low she'd line us up so this one did that this one did that and dad would just whip that belt out <laughs> and, and and whack us all so i mean it was hard for him to express any kind of love since he was always put on to be the disciplinarian so there's there's those kinds of things that you have to think about. The fourth one is the one you want to strive to be, the authoritative parent. This kind of parent is authoritative, not an overbearing authoritarian, but a compassionate yet firm authority. They have clear boundaries, but are also very loving. The result is a child 
high in self-esteem and equipped with good coping skills. That's our goal. We want to become that kind of a parent. Okay? We all are able to be that kind of a parent regardless of the kind of modeling that we have because every one of us had a, a different kinds of parents, right? right? Some of you may even have had step parents, <laughs> right? Had some step parents involved and so forth <clears throat> and extended family members. Some Nowadays there's so many kids being raised by their grandparents. Right. Great grandparent. I mean, there's just all kinds of different things going on. So you you see something that's being modeled in front of you. You know, when you think about the story of Eli and Samuel, <clears throat> Eli didn't. You know, he he was a neglectful parent. He never disciplined his kids. He just didn't really care what they were doing. It's like they were happy and so forth. But if you follow the story of Samuel, who became a mighty prophet, and God really met, you know spoke through Samuel, and, and he was a mighty man of God. You'll find out later when the people come to Samuel and they say, we want a king over us. You've been a wonderful judge, but unfortunately your sons do not walk in integrity like you do. So we want a king. And I thought, wait a minute. What, what happened there? Samuel actually ended up doing what Eli had done. Mm -hmm. And not even realize it because that's all the modeling of a father figure that he had. He was given as a child into the temple to be raised in the temple to serve the Lord. And so that was the only modeling that he ever has is watching Eli raise his kids. Even though he knew it was wrong, he, he didn't have anything else to go on at the time. He couldn't get on the internet and find this wonderful article like we did, right? So I thought it was interesting that Sam ended up doing what Eli had done. There's a great book, Raising Kingdom Kids by Tony Evans, that you should get a hold of that will help you mom, dad. The third thing is that contentment is the real goal, not happiness. Happiness is always dependent on, on you know, the outward circumstances. Happiness is dependent on how we feel, our emotions. Everybody knows that our emotions go up and down depending what time of day it is, depending on our hormones, you know, depending on whether we're sick or not. You know, our emotions just can go up and down and can be very easily, by the way, our emotions are always being manipulated in some way or another. Anybody watch the news long enough and see the political situation, your blood's going to fall regardless of what party you're on, right? Well, they're never kind of Republican. You're, you're going to be a mad sooner or later at the injustice of it all. It doesn't matter which party you're in. They're, they, you know, so your emotions just go up and down depending on what's on the news. <clears throat> but contentment is an inner peace inside that is not dependent on our outward circumstances. We could be very content. We could be very poor and be very content. We don't have to have a lot of stuff. It's true, it's true right? Any, anybody experience that when you were, you know, or maybe you are, when, when we were, you know, struggling for the finances and trying to make ends meet, but you have that peace that God is taking care of you, that God's going to provide for you, and so you're not worried about it, and so you have this inner peace, and that that is contentment. It may not be happiness, right, uh, but you have that contentment. In First Timothy 6.6, 6, godliness with contentment is great gain. Contentment means we're grateful for what we have. And we're not focused on what we like. Contentment means we're thankful and it shows in our attitude. Contentment is that when you see a kid spending more time playing with a stick they found in the backyard than that high dollar toy you bought. Or I love uh, Christmas, I don't know if it was this last Christmas, the kids, the little ones that open all their, their Christmas presents and the, the small ones and uh, Mia and uh, Ruby and I mean they, they'd open all their stuff and and what do they do? They see this big empty box in the middle of the room and they decide they all want to get in the box at the same time. And they were just so happy to get in this cardboard box and you're sitting there going, I can't believe I just spent $50 on that dog. I should have just gone to the U-Haul place and bought a box, which is next year's Christmas present. Everybody's getting a box. Danny's getting a box, Veronica's getting a box, everybody's getting a box. Because that's contentment. A cardboard box is contentment. <laughs> yeah, forget the toys. Got to buy batteries anyway. A cardboard box needs no batteries. Thank you, Jesus. Contentment is just like other things that our children learn. It is more caught than taught. In other words, if they see you living in contentment, and they see you worshiping the Lord and loving life and loving God, they're going to catch that attitude from you. 
But if you're always unhappy about what you don't have, you know, you're always striving to get something else, then they're going to pick that up that that's how life is to be lived. There's a free parenting assessment tool that I'll put a link in there for you so you can go in there and find out what kind of parent you are. Ooh, who's scared to take that assessment this morning? Anybody scared to take the assessment? I don't know. I'm a little leery. But, uh, yeah, I think I'm going to I think I'm gonna try that and, and see what happens. I saw it, and I was going to take it, and I thought, no, I don't want to take it. I better wait till after the sermon. Then I'll find out and see how horrible I, of a parent I was. But we want our children to basically love and know God. That's what we want. All these parenting fails. I suggested a book, 10 Mistakes Parents Make with Teenagers and How to Avoid Them. I use that book. It helped us a lot when we had our teenagers, and it's still a wonderful book. There's a lot of good things, a lot of good advice. There's a lot of good books, a lot of good articles out there. Get on Dr. Dobson's Focus on the Family website. Sign up to receive his parenting articles. And, you know, just such wonderful information. I mean, just awesome every day i read an article i'm like man where was this yeah. right when these kids were little and man we were just flying by the seat of our pants yeah. and trying to figure things out and you know we were so strict with our firstborn and the second one a little bit less so by the time we got the fifth one it was autopilot <laughs> raise yourself kid it's gonna be all right it's not the end of the world it's gonna be okay <clears throat> You know, it's not it's not as bad, it's not as hard as we think it is. If, if you just have one, mom and dad, if you just have one simple ingredient, if you love God with all your heart, yes, it's not that hard. You're going to make mistakes. I'm going to tell you this, and I've said it before. There's no such thing as a perfect father or a perfect mother. You've never seen one. You've never been one. I've never seen one, and I've never been one. They don't exist. What it does exist is imperfect men and women who love God, who are trying to do absolutely the best for their children. We're going to make mistakes. I mean, I may know you've made a mistake somewhere along the line, right? Even when they're grown and you're watching them live their life and you sit there and you talk to your wife and you say, where did we go wrong with that one? What, what did we miss with that one over there? Man, Lord, help me. How can we redeem that? I don't know. Maybe too late. Pray. We've got to pray. That's why we come to prayer meeting. Yeah. Pray for our kids. Lord Jesus, you know I made a mess over there on that one. God, you've got to help me, Jesus. Help yes. me, Lord. Yes. Come on, I'm being serious. Yes, yeah. yes, you're right. I, I'm, right? Yes. Yes. I'm totally being serious about that. We have made mistakes. We all have made mistakes. But God can help us to be good moms and dads if we put God first. And keep that priority. That is our number one part. To love God. And to love people. And God will give us wisdom. To love the children. And to raise them in a way that they will honor God. Alright. Let's have our praise team come up. See it wasn't so bad. I didn't scare you too bad. Didn't do too much damage. Listen. I couldn't I can, I can mess you guys up. You don't need help from me for that. Ha, 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 ha,